Good morning and welcome to First Forger. We are so excited to get to worship the Lord with you today. Today we're going to worship together through song. We are going to hear Pastor Charlie bring the word. But before any of that happens, one of my favorite things that happens in this church, we are going to baptize one of our kids today. So we are going to celebrate as a church family as we watch our friend Connor get baptized. Well, I want to say thank you for joining us today, whether you're here in person or online. It's going to be a great celebration. If you plan to worship through the giving of tithes and offering, if you would put your gifts in the boxes at the entrances to the worship center, or you can give online at firstborger.com backslash giving. Also, if you are a guest who is with us today, we'd like for you to look in the pew back in front of you. There are some black and white connect cards. If you would, fill one of those out so that we can connect with you throughout the week. Now remember, those aren't just for guests. If you would like to figure out how to serve in one of the ministries in our church, such as children's ministry, it's a great place to be, uh, you can fill one of those cards out, put them in the offering boxes before you leave, and we will get you connected with one of our ministries. Also, we want to pray with you. We know that everyone walks through hard times, and we as a church staff want to walk alongside you. So if you have anything that we can be praying for you, if you will please write it on those cards. We gather a couple of times during the week, and we have those cards, and we like to pray for you guys. So remember, if you're a new person, if you want to get connected in a ministry, or if you need prayer, fill one of those cards out and put them in the boxes before you leave today. Well, I don't want to delay us any further. We're going to get our celebration started. So if you would, please bow your head and pray with me. Father God, we come before you today, and we are so excited to get to celebrate with our friend Connor. God, we praise you today that he has come to know you, that he is a heart friend, and that you have called him to be one of your own. God, we thank you for the opportunity to come alongside him, to encourage him, and to watch him grow. God, we pray blessings over this entire service as we worship you and as we grow together as a family. In your precious name. Amen. If you would, please turn your attention to the baptistry. Well, good morning. I'd like to introduce my, my friend Connor Fisher to you. Connor's 11 years old, and we had a wonderful conversation a good Friday evening and talked about baptism, talked about what baptism was and what it wasn't, talked about salvation, and Connor shared with me how last year at VBS he had accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And he understood and he wanted to follow Jesus' example of believer's baptism. So we're here to share that with you today. So Connor, I'm going to ask you to turn this direction right here. And just put your hands up there like we talked about. Now, Connor, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that God raised him from the dead? Yes, sir. And Connor, upon your public profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Pray with Christ and baptism. Raise you off in the name of God. That just never gets old, I just tell you. That's just great stuff. Pray with me, shall we? Father, we just thank you so much for Connor and for this public profession of his faith in Jesus Christ. We thank you at that tender age, Lord. He recognized his need for a Savior. And he said yes to Jesus, Lord. And that from every day forth in his life, Father, he never has to worry about his salvation. He never has to worry about where he'll spend his eternity because that's assured. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness and for your goodness. And we thank you for Connor's public profession of faith that Jesus Christ is indeed Lord. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we give you all the glory. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to First Borger today. And thanks so much for spending part of your weekend with us. Here are a few things you need to know, so check it out. Join us May 15th as we steward and see what God is doing here at First Border during our quarterly church conference. Men, Friday, May 13th, there will be a men's steak night featuring guest speaker Andy Dietz. The cost is $10 and $5 for boys 10 and under. Sign up at the Connect Desk, Sunday school or church office.
Hey, I am Kelly Minter, and I would love to welcome you to Encountering God, Cultivating Habits of Faith Through the Spiritual Disciplines. Families, churches, communities crumble without the influence of a kingdom man. God is looking for kingdom men. If you missed the men and women's Bible studies this week, it's not too late. Wednesday, 6 p.m., First Women are doing the study by Kelly Minter, Encountering God. Also on Wednesday night, the men are going through Tony Evans' study, Kingdom Man. And as always, each Wednesday, we have our midweek activities that include choir, First Kids, 4, 5, 6, and First Student Surf. This Friday, May 6th, is the Pan Fork Adult Camp Day. Vans will leave the church at 8 a.m. as we enjoy great meals, music, and ministry featuring Dr. Ernie Perkins. Please sign up at the Connect desk or notify the church office. We have to come up with a VBS theme reveal idea that's so exciting, so compelling, that everyone in church is going to want to rush down to the front and volunteer to help in VBS this summer. <laughs> yeah, I can't think of anything. Oh, I know. How about a balloon filled with confetti? an idea. Everybody loves food. Why don't we have a cake? Oh. Thanks for sharing, Dad. I have an idea. We could do the theme reveals with fireworks. <laughs> Firework, confetti balloons, and cake. We don't need any of this show to convince you that volunteering for VBS will change the life of a child. Grab your sunnies, that's your sunglasses and your mates. Those are your friends. And get ready for a fair dinkum time at Numeran. <laughs> For more information about what's going on here at First Burger, check Facebook, firstburger.com, and grab a calendar at the entrances on your way out today. Thank you for joining us today. We're so glad you're here. Well, good morning. Please stand with us. Josh said that cake was tasty. After it ended up on the floor, I didn't want to eat it. You know, teenagers, they'll eat anything, right? <laughs> so just join us. We're just going to take this moment and just lift up the Lord. We have so many things to be thankful for this morning. We saw it with baptism. But just getting to come in the room and together lift our voices to praise the King of kings and Lord of lords. There's nothing better. So, God, we just lift our voices to you this morning, Lord. We thank you and we love you. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.
Song declaring we be 
in his arms to take and shield you. You will find a song The Christ alone, the cornerstone, the weak made strong, and the same.
God, we stand in here in this room the sinful, weak people. We all have areas in our lives that fall completely short of you, God. But because of your love, because of your grace, we stand here righteous people with the Spirit of God in us and through us, with the power of God in us moving through us this morning. So we stand this morning thankful to you, God, that we are weak people that are made strong because of your love. That through the storms that we can lean on you. Lord, through the power of prayer, we can take every need to you, God. So this morning we come and we pray and ask you, Lord, for the sick in this room, we pray that you touch their bodies this morning. We pray in Jesus' name that you begin to heal cancer. We pray in Jesus' name that you heal carpal tunnel in arms this morning, God. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that you begin to heal families. We lift up mental illness to you, God, because you are stronger than that. We pray this morning, Lord, as the word is spoken of that hard so our hard soil is just busted up and that we can receive the word that you put in us this morning, God. Lord, that we can open up our hearts to make you fully Lord. We thank you for all you do, God. We thank you for all who you are. We love you, and in Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. You may be seated. God's bigger than any problem you may have walked in that door with this morning. Now you may feel like, yeah, Pastor Charlie, but you don't know how big my problem is. You don't know what's going on in my life. You don't know what the doctor said. You don't know what the job situation's like. You don't know what my wife just said to me or my husband just said to me or what he did to me. But God is bigger. God is simply bigger than any problem. You know, in life, what we do is we, we tend to focus so much on the problem that it's just like putting our hands up to our face and we can't see anything except the problem. God's bigger. Through the storm, you know, I'm always reminded of that passage of Scripture where, where they're in the boat and Jesus is asleep at the boat, the head of the boat, and, and the disciples fearing for their lives and they wake him up and he's just like, peace be still. Is there a storm in your life today? Y'all probably saw on the news, I watched the, 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 the footage of the tornado that hit Andover in Wichita, Kansas, and maybe some of you have family up there. Devastating. God's bigger than that. God's more powerful than that. And all those splintered lives, those splintered houses, God can put them all back together. God can put your marriage back together. God can put your life back together. God can put your body back together. So this is a little out of the ordinary. wasn't in the script. Sorry. But let's just stand up, would you? Would you please just stand up one more time? And here's what I want you to do. If, if you're facing a storm in your life this morning right now, whether it's physical, emotional, relational, financial, whatever it is, whatever the storm is that you're facing right now, do this for me. Just take a step of faith. Just, just come stand right down here, would you? Just come stand right down here, and we're just going to surround you. We're just going to pray over you. And we're going to sing that song over you because Christ is the cornerstone. You know, when you build something, you set that cornerstone, and everything is square from that point forward. Everything in your life is true when Christ is the cornerstone. So if you need prayer this morning, I don't care what it is. If you need prayer, just would you just have the humility? Would you just have the faith? Just step out right now and just come right here. Just come right here. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Clarence. Anybody else? Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Larry family. Phil and Vicki. Anybody else? Those of you that are tuned in on the live stream, I know this is unusual. I know you're like, what can I do? I'm, I'm, I'm 100 miles away. I'm 1,000 miles away. You let us know that you need prayer, and we will pray for you. Christ alone, the cornerstone. 
weak made strong in the Savior's love. God is so good and He is so faithful. And He sees your affliction. You know, He he told Moses from that burning bush, I've heard the cry of my people and I've seen their affliction. And what did He do? He sent a Redeemer. Anybody else need prayer? Okay, here's what I'm going to ask y'all to do. I'm going to ask y'all to just push in just a little bit closer if you would. If you feel comfortable coming down and surrounding these folks right here, if you feel comfortable, you come. Just reach out your hand behind them. Touch them on their back. Touch them on their shoulder. Or just stand there behind them. But I just want them to feel your love. Each person that came down here this morning for prayer needs to know that they're not the only one. They need to know that people that they've never seen before love them enough to bring the the presence of Christ within them here to pray for them. Thank you, guys. See, folks, this this is the church. It's what the church does. It doesn't care what color you are. It doesn't care how you're dressed. It doesn't matter how many tattoos you have or how many piercings you have. It doesn't matter what your affliction, what the trial in your life is. We just love you like Jesus. You know why? Because somebody loved us like Jesus enough to share the gospel with us. So, Jake, if you could put the words, that chorus back up there and there, I just want you guys to sing the chorus while I pray over them. Can we do that? And then you guys right here, y'all just pray over these folks. You don't have to know their name. You don't have to know what it is. God knows. And there's power in corporate prayer. Amen? Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, Lord. And Father, these have, these have come forward, Father. They've acknowledged that there's a storm in their life. These have acknowledged, Lord, that they're powerless. They're fearful, Lord. They're struggling in their bodies. They're struggling in their minds. They're struggling in their hearts, God. Father, they need a touch from you, Lord. And they've come down here this morning, Lord. Father, they've taken that step of faith. God, they've, they've turned their eyes to you. They've, for just a moment, Lord, they've taken their eyes off the problem and they've recognized that you are bigger, you are more powerful, you are stronger, and that all healing comes from your hand, God. And so they've come this morning, God. And they've said, Lord, here I am. Just as I am, God, would you just touch me? God, I can't do this on my own. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you touch each person that's here, Lord. Father, whatever their point of need is, God, you know it. Father, I pray that broken bodies are healed. Broken minds are healed. Broken hearts are healed. Broken relationships are healed. Father, I pray that each person here, Lord, senses the presence of God in a a real and tangible way, Lord. That they feel your presence just as they feel an arm or a hand on their back. They know that you're here. They know that they are loved, and they know that you have a plan and a purpose in all things. And most importantly, Lord, that they know that all things work together for good, that them that love you and are called according to your purpose. All things, all things, all things, all things work together for good. And Father, we thank you that you're a God that's near and not far away. That you're a God that's active and involved in his creation. That you care, you give a rip what happens to your people, Lord. Christ alone, cornerstone, sing it. Lift up your voices to God.
thank you, church, for being the church this morning. God, we give you all the glory. It's in Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Well, Mitch, no matter what you say, I think we've already had church this morning, and I praise God for it. <laughs> praise the Lord. Well, we've had a great week so far, and Mitch, since uh, Friday night, we had a wonderful Shabbat dinner. Those of you that came, let's practice. Shabbat Shalom. Okay, pretty weak. Let's try it one more time. Shabbat Shalom. All right, see, Mitch, you've, you've made progress already. People here in Border are speaking Hebrew. No, it's been a great week, and, and a couple of things I want to let you guys know. I, I had a meeting with the, uh, some of the folks from CareNet Pregnancy Center here a few weeks ago, and, and they've got a new, a new project that they're wanting to do, and, and they need mentors. You know, a lot of these families find themselves in, in an, an unplanned or even an unwanted pregnancy, and, and they have a wonderful ministry here. Many of you attended the banquet on Thursday night. Many of you support that ministry and have for years. But they want to take that a step further. They, will, they would like to have a list of people from each church so that someone can sit down and look at a list and say, I'd like to talk with someone from that church. And so if you would be interested in just being a mentor, just someone, basically all you really need to do is just give them your ear. You know, a lot of times pastoral care is just bringing the incarnational presence of Christ in you and just listening. But if that's something that you might be interested in, would you contact a church office? Because we're wanting to put together a list of names of some people uh, that would be interested in, in visiting with these folks. And you're not making a lifelong commitment. You're not going to take on their debts. You're, you know, nothing like that. You're just there to kind of give them a perspective that maybe they don't have on life and the importance of life and the importance of life in Christ. Amen. So if that's something you'd be interested in, we, we'd sure like to have your name. So just contact the church office, or you can text me or email me. Either way, just let me know if that's something I'd be interested in do. Also, just a reminder, this Wednesday night's the first Wednesday of the month, so we'll have a meal uh, Wednesday night at, at, at 530, and we'll look forward to that. And then we'll, It's not too late if you haven't signed up for the Lays Bible Center, Men's Bible Center. We'd love to have you. That starts at 6 o'clock. So love to have you for dinner, et cetera. Um, before I introduce Mitch, just want to... Let you know how much we appreciate you, Mitch. Um, Mitch Foreman is here from Chosen People Ministries. He was here last year. We did Messiah and the Passover. And for many of you, that was your first experience with the Passover Seder. And, and he, he showed you the, the, the Christ in the Seder, the Christ in the, in, the, in the Passover celebration or observance. And then he did the same thing for us this past Friday night as we, we celebrated the Shabbat dinner. And Mitch and, and, and uh, Chosen People, when they come, they come on a love offering basis. So I just want to encourage you on your way out at, at the offering boxes at, at the exits there. If you would just tuck a little love offering, whatever the Lord lays on your heart for, for Mitch and for chosen people, we'd appreciate that very much. And then at the end of the service, uh, I'm gonna, before we dismiss, I'm, and uh, we're also going to pray over Kim and Marion who will be leaving for Israel tomorrow on their mission trip. So we'll be praying over them. But before we dismiss, I'm going to ask Mitch to go right outside the, the door over here to the Connect Desk area, and he's got a resource table. He's got some books and materials that, that you want to check out uh, before he comes. So, kids, time to go to First Kids. If you're visiting with us and have kids from kindergarten through the fourth grade, they're going to go and have a great time. By the way, just, uh, just another plug for VBS. I don't know if you heard me or not, but, but Connor that we baptized this morning, Connor accepted Christ at VBS last year. And I can tell you, I, I've been around VBSs for a long, 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 long time. And this church does VBS better than any church I've ever seen. But we can't do it without volunteers like you. It is a kingdom-rewarding, kingdom-returning investment when you invest in VBS. So with them on their way out, I'd like to introduce Mitch Foreman to you guys, Chosen People Ministries. He'll tell you a little bit about himself. He'll tell you a little bit about the ministry. And because we had the baptism this morning, Mitch and I talked a, a week or so ago, and I said, you know, we're going to have a baptism. And so we kind of talked about changing up the order of some of the things that he was going to do. And so, so you're going to see the benefit of that this morning as we, we look in John chapter 3. So, Mitch, please come. Let's give him a warm First Baptist welcome.
yes, there we go. Well, it's nice to be here in Borger, and as you know, it's my second time here, and I'm getting to know you guys a little bit. I haven't bought my first cowboy hat yet, though. I was going to preach in jeans and cowboy boots, and I thought that that might be appropriate, but I'm not quite there yet. So maybe a few more times. And my name is Mitch Foreman, and I work for what I believe one of the most exciting ministries in the world, Chosen People Ministry of Jews and Gentiles who are sharing the gospel to Jewish people. And I often call Jewish people the most unreached people group in the world that live right next door. And we're spread out all over the world. And we're very, very difficult to reach because a lot of barriers exist. So, for example, growing up, I grew up in a town called Peabody, Massachusetts, a little bit north of Boston. Can you guys say Boston? Very good. And you notice that I have an accent because I'm from an area of the United States in my neighborhood, you were either Jewish or Catholic. Did not meet, I didn't know what Baptist was, had no idea what Protestants were. My neighborhood, you were either Catholic or Jewish, and everything when you're a kid is viewed through your neighborhood. And I knew that there were differences. Hey, let me just get settled here for a little bit. I knew that there were some differences. First of all, we just read the Old Testament, and growing up, I thought that Christians, they just read the New Testament. I knew that we worshiped on Saturday, because I went to synagogue, and my Catholic friends would go to the Catholic Church on Sunday. And the biggest difference was, they believed that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. And growing up Jewish, we're still waiting for the Messiah to come. And my Catholic friends would tell me, you know, but Jesus was Jewish. And I go, I know that. But he converted and became Gentile and started this whole new religion. And that's kind of how the Jewish world sees this thing that we're doing. That Gentiles found their Messiah, his name is Jesus, and it's okay for Gentiles to believe that Jesus is their Messiah, but that the Jewish people are still waiting for their Messiah. Because when Jesus came, he didn't quite fit the model of the Messiah that they were looking for. They're looking for a King David. They were looking for a military person to come and destroy their enemies and set up the kingdom. And to be honest with you, that's what Jewish people are still waiting for today. If you ask the average Jewish person, you know, what's going to happen when the Jewish Messiah comes the same 2,000 years ago as it is today? He's going to come and defeat our enemies, and our enemies have changed over the years, but the reality is, is that's what they're waiting for. So when you present the gospel to Jewish people, it doesn't sound very Jewish. You use terms that Jewish people find to be very Christian, like you use the word Christ. Well, the Jewish people, we use the word Messiah. You say, born again. We have a different term, baptism. We have the term for baptism in, in Judaism. Did you know that? But we call it a mikvah, because the mikvah is the pool that you actually get dunked into. So we kind of see that there's two different worlds grow going on, and they kind of obviously intersect a little bit, but the reality is that when Jewish people look at what's going on in the church, they don't see it very Jewish. Well, I didn't realize until I became a believer that everything that you do is Jewish. Did you know that? I didn't realize that the New Testament was written by all Jewish men. I had no idea Peter and Paul were Jewish growing up. Did you know that? I thought they were Catholic. <laughs> I mean, what Jewish guy has a Roman Catholic church named after him? I didn't know Paul was Jewish, and I was always told Peter was the first pope. So how is he Jewish? Had no idea. 
And as I started to study more and more, you know what I came to realize? There's a lot of things you do that you don't know is Jewish. So I want you to put on your Jewish eyeglasses this morning. I'm preaching in one of my favorite texts because I get to pull back the curtain and give you now the Jewish viewpoint of a passage that I'm sure everyone here has read. We're going to go to John chapter 3. Jesus having a conversation between himself and Nicodemus. And I want you to kind of come on a journey with me because I want you to see from maybe a different perspective. Because we're told certain things growing up, but I guess when you look at the text from a Jewish standpoint, it looks a little bit different. So let's read, and okay, the text is a little bit small. I apologize for that, but we all have our Bibles. So if you would turn to the book of Yochanan, you know what book that is? That's John's Hebrew name, Yochanan. And if you would turn to John chapter 3 and the first verse. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Okay, first clue. Who's the Pharisee? Well, Pharisee is kind of a, what we would call a rabbi. He's not really official. Because in Judaism, you have three official positions. You have prophet, priest, and king. The Pharisees kind of self-imposed themselves on the Jewish people for the last 200 years before Christ and at the time of Jesus. They, together with the, with the Sadducees, formed the leadership of the Jewish people and were running everything. And he's one of the rulers. He's a pretty important guy. So we know that he knows a lot. Okay? And as we see that he's a Pharisee, he's an esteemed leader, he's a teacher of the law, as I mentioned, he's a member of the Sanhedrin, and he is a very prominent person in Judaism. Next slide. He came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miracle if God was not with them. Okay, so here's another look. He's a rabbi who comes to Jesus at night, and I know a lot of people believe that Nicodemus comes at night. Why? Hence the picture of the moon. I want you to get the setting. He comes at night because he's a secret believer and he doesn't want anybody to know that he's there. Now, I'm going to give you a whole different perspective of things. You know why? I don't believe that Nicodemus is a secret believer. I don't think he knows what to believe yet. And when you look at the text, you're going to see that Jesus is very, very smart. Jesus, he meets people where they are. The book of John is an incredible book on the missionary style of Jesus. Where's the first witness? At a wedding. His first encounter of who he is as the Messiah is with friends and family. Then he meets the woman at the well. He purposely went to go meet her in the, in the afternoon where he knew she would be. He goes to the man who's born, you know, paralyzed and he can't walk, and he goes to meet him at a certain time in a certain place. But Jesus doesn't go to meet Nicodemus. He does something to attract Nicodemus to him. And it comes out in the text. We've seen the signs that you were doing. See, Jesus did those miraculous things to get Nicodemus' attention, okay? And look at what Jesus, Nicodemus says. He says to Jesus, Rabbi, well, why is that important? 
Well, first of all, Jesus wasn't recognized as a rabbi like Nicodemus, but Jesus had a pretty big following. So Nicodemus is recognizing the fact that Jesus is someone important too. But he does it for a reason. Because Jesus, he's representing a group of people and they're trying to attract the same people as the Pharisees. See, the Sadducees were priests, and they kind of walked around, and they were kind of detached from the Jewish culture, but the Pharisees started to make inroads because they started to really care for the average person and even the person on the fringe. Well, who was Jesus ministering to? Those same people. So this kind of attention, because you get two leaders of two different groups that are going after, in a sense, the attention of the same people. And Nicodemus recognizes that, you know? And so, who is Jesus? He's a rabbi, he's a teacher, he's sent from God, he's performing miracles, and God is with him. Now, you have to understand how rabbis talk. And you know what, Charlie, I apologize because I think with the moon in the background, you quite can't read it. That's actually done on purpose, so you have to listen to me. <laughs> but I apologize. I'll have to remember next time to uh, do it more on the black background. But let me give you an idea of why Nicodemus called him rabbi. Because rabbis have a certain way of talking to each other that you and I d don't do. Uh, anybody here a lawyer? Well, I find that lawyers talk to each other in terms that the average person doesn't understand because you have your own way of talking and lawyers and judges know that talk, but the average person, we don't, and we just trust that you're doing the right thing. <laughs> well, rabbis have a way of talking to each other. See, rabbis never ask another rabbi a question. They make a statement, and then the statement is actually the question. You know, for example, my wife comes home after I've been away for a week, and she's got new hairdo, color totally different, new dress, and I go, oh wow, nice haircut. And guys, we kind of know what we're basically saying, right? Like, wow, how much did that cost? <laughs> so we make a statement, and there's a question, and that's what Nicodemus is doing here. He's asking a question in the vernacular that Jesus would have fully understood. And why do I not think that Nicodemus is a secret believer? Because he says, we know. He didn't say, I know, or I was watching. We know. You know why I think Nicodemus came at night? He just wanted to have a little one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. Like, if you were going to meet the President of the United States, if you notice, a lot of official business happens in the daytime when everybody's around, they ask them questions, they take pictures. I'm going to guess that a lot of um, side conversations one-on-one -on -one, happens with the President of the United States at night when kind of not the press isn't around as much. So this is what I kind of think is here. You know what really Nicodemus is doing? He's asking him, are you the one? Are you him? We've been waiting for him. You're sent from God. You're a great teacher. You're performing miracles. You're doing the thing that we think you could be the Messiah. And so he's asking him that question in a way that Jesus would have understood. And look at how Jesus answers. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's a pretty interesting way of answering, are you the Messiah? Because he could have just said yes. But he wants to give Nicodemus an understanding of who he is and what he's going to do, and now he has to talk in the language that Nicodemus would understand. So he says, Nicodemus, 
the Messiah is coming, but he's really not going to come the way that you think he is. He is from the line of David, but he's not going to set up his kingdom in the way that Nicodemus was thinking of. But he has a kingdom, but now he needs to get you into the kingdom. Now, if you were the ruler of the Jews, would you think that Nicodemus had any questions whether he was going to heaven or not? He's a great rabbi. He's the ruler of the Jews. You think that he's thinking, I've done a lot of things in my life. I'm a good person. I've done a lot of good deeds. I'm one of the leaders. I'm in. Because at the time of Nicodemus, you know what Nicodemus was teaching people? Work hard, do all these commandments. God will look at you. He has a skill. And at the end of your life, he'll say, good job, you're in. And Jesus is saying, no, that's not the way it's going to work. Because the gospel is totally opposite of how everybody thought you would get into the kingdom. And he says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now, I love that term because if we use that term today, if you met somebody and they said, are you born again? What would they be asking you? Yeah, you're one of those like real crazy Bible-carrying evangelical Christians, right? I love when I'm re watching the news and they'll say, and the born-again Christians voted this way. And I'm thinking, how do they know who's born again? <laughs> like, you know, it doesn't say when you go to vote whether you're born again or not, right? But do you know that born again is a very Jewish term? See, we see it, even if you asked a Jewish person today, are you born again? They would see that as a, more of a Christian term because, again, it's very prominent in the New Testament. But it was very prominent being used at the time of Nicodemus because they used the term for Gentiles who were converting to Judaism. So you know what Jesus is telling Nicodemus? You must be like a Gentile convert to get into heaven. That's a pretty interesting statement to say to somebody, isn't it? You must be born again. And the reason why that term is used, because in Judaism, we have a religion that allows Gentiles to come to the temple, stand in the court of the Gentiles, see what's going on, and I can convert to being Jewish. And the way that you do it is that you follow a certain rabbi's teaching and he will teach you how to keep kosher, how to live a Jewish life, how to do all these things. At the end of your teachings and your studies, you have one last act to do. You go into a mikveh, or we would call a baptismal pool. You get completely naked, you take off all your jewelry and everything, you stand in the baptismal pool or the mikveh, and you stretch out all your fingers because the water has to hit every crevice, and then you dunk yourself three times by yourself, and you do it in the name of the rabbi that was teaching you. And when you come up the third time, guess what? You're not Gentile. You know what you are? A newborn Jew. And we call it born again, and you know what the baptismal pool is a figure of? A womb. Because that's how you give birth, right? You come out of water. So the mitzvah is, in a sense, an idea that a Gentile can be born again, and now this time you're born Jewish. So you're Nicodemus, and you are hearing Jesus say, you must be like a Gentile convert to, to go to heaven? Well, Charlie, if you met a rabbi today, even somebody Orthodox, or Kim, you're going to Israel, and Orthodox Jew comes up to you and says, what must I do to get into the kingdom of heaven? What would you tell them? You must be born again. And they'd go, I have to be like a Gentile convert, and you would go, yes. The same thing applies today. He would probably take a step back, 
but you don't know, I'm orthodox, I do all these laws or whatever, and you'd say, it doesn't matter. You must be like the Gentile convert. You must give your life over to let God do it instead of you doing it. And what is Nicodemus says, how can a man be born when he is old? He can't enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? So he's playing with Jesus. You know when I told you that they have a way of speaking to each other and it's called pill pull? Well, you can be a little salty. You can tell the other person your mother wears army boots. <laughs> you want to try to get their attention and you're going back and forth. Modern times, the way the Jewish students learn the, um, the text, we call it benching. You sit across a bench between each other and you go back and forth and it's benching and this is what Nicodemus and Jesus are doing. Because Nicodemus can't believe that Jesus is telling him this. Hey, he's the ruler of the Jews. And then Jesus clarifies, truly, truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he can enter the kingdom of God. So you have two births. You have a physical birth and you do come out of water. You have a spiritual birth that you must be born in the spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. Not you should, you must. And Nicodemus is probably now thinking, this was not the conversation that I came here for. And look at how Jesus, you know, Nicodemus asks in verse 9, how can these things be? He has no idea. So when you say he's a secret believer, Jesus is telling him the plan of the kingdom. And he says, I give up. I don't even know what you're talking about here. How can these things be? And look at how Jesus says, you're the teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? He's saying, how are you going to get people into the kingdom if you don't even understand it yourself? Now, I didn't expect Nicodemus really to know this stuff. You know why? Because you know who the first person to come to the Jewish world and tell the Jewish world that the plan of the Messiah the first time was going to be totally opposite of what they thought? It's Jesus. And why do you think he waited for Nicodemus to present all this? Because he's the leader of the Jewish people. And what better person to try to convince that you're the Messiah through a way that's a little bit different than the woman at the well and the man who's been born blind and all that. You have to do it academically too. You have to do it where he is at. Nicodemus says, how can these things be? And Jesus says, and you're the teacher of Israel? And then Jesus says, let me now present the plan. Verse 11. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony if I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Now here's a little twist because Jesus says, we speak of what we know. Remember Nicodemus at the beginning said, hey, we think you're the Messiah. And they have a conversation. And now Jesus says, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and yet you don't accept our testimony. So a lot of people think when he's saying we, he's speaking as the third person and the Godhead, but I don't think so. When I start looking at the text after this, Nicodemus is representing himself as the leaders of the Jewish people. Well, God has leaders of the Jewish people. They're called prophets. And, you know, Jesus is not only a priest and a king. You know what else Jesus is? He's a prophet. And he's saying, we speak. He's telling Nicodemus, Nicodemus, the prophets have been speaking to you for thousands of years, and you didn't listen to them. 
So if you want to convince what you're going to do as the Messiah to somebody like Nicodemus, guess where you have to go to? Back to the Jewish prophets. Remember, the New Testament hasn't been written yet. And Jesus gives Nicodemus a tremendous Bible study on a different picture of the Messiah that he had no idea was coming. And let's just look at these things so that you can see how Jesus methodically is going to tell Nicodemus three things about himself that he had no idea. They were looking for a descendant of King David. They had no idea that it was going to be God in the flesh. They were looking for somebody to conquer their enemies. Nicodemus had no idea their enemy was sin and that he was going to come and die for their sins. And Nicodemus was looking for a Jewish Messiah to save who? Jewish people. And he had no idea that the Jewish Messiah was coming for everyone. And Jesus is going to go back into the Old Testament to three well-known prophets, and that's what we're going to see here. In verse 13. No one has ascended into heaven, but he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. So why does Jesus say that? Well, one, he's quoting from the book of Daniel. We saw Daniel a lot in the book of Revelation, but now he's going to quote the fact that in Daniel chapter 9, it says, one like the Son of Man was in heaven, and to him was given glory and power and a kingdom, and he comes riding in on a cloud like as a, as a, as a king, as an overseer, as the Messiah. The term Son of Man in Judaism means that you're the Messiah. But look at where he says he's coming from. Daniel says, the Messiah, even though he's going to be born, will come from heaven. They weren't expecting the Messiah to be fully God and fully human. Nobody was expecting that. But that's who Jesus is. He's telling Nicodemus, and I'm sure there might have been other discussions, that he is part of the Godhead, but he became flesh. Amazing. As I told you, you know, when I was growing up, this is one of the biggest barriers to witnessing to Jewish people because Jewish people think Christians believe in three gods. Did you know that? The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they don't see it very Jewish. The reality is, is that the Trinity couldn't be any more Jewish because it's not found anywhere else other than in Judaism. The idea of God being three in one is a Jewish concept and you can't duplicate it. In the, in the Bible study we had on this morning, you know, the evil one will attempt to try to do it, but he can't. How does three in one work? I, <laughs> I can't answer that. Maybe when we're in heaven and we get to see God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit interacting, we'll have a better idea, but... Nicodemus wasn't expecting the Messiah to be God in the flesh, but that's who he is in Daniel. In Daniel chapter, <clears throat> excuse me, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, says that. Next one. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Why is he referring to some obscure few verses in the wilderness, well, <laughs> that scenario was done to point to the Messiah and Nicodemus didn't realize it because they wouldn't think that that would apply to the Messiah, but think about it. They're in the wilderness, they're complaining. God sends serpents. Serpents represent not the nicest thing in the Jewish world. The people are sinning and they're dying from the snake bites. They go to Moses, intercede, help. Okay, I'll go talk to God. Comes back. Okay, guys, here's the game plan. Uh, we're going to take the most despicable image in the Jewish world and we're going to bronze it. 
we're going to put it on a stick, and if you look at it, you live. And they went, what? <laughs> That's the plan? We have to just look at that on the stick and we live? Yep. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I know, that's God's way. <laughs> you can't earn your way. God does it. So, I don't think Nicodemus had any idea that the Messiah was coming to die for sin. It's nowhere in any of the Jewish writings before Jesus comes. It's brand new. And Nicodemus is going to try to process this. And personally, you know when I think Nicodemus came to faith? When he saw Jesus up on the cross. And he probably went, how did he know? How did he know not only he was going to die that way, but now he, in a sense, Nicodemus would have said, he wants me to put my faith in him. And that's very Jewish. And the cross, to be honest with you, in the Jewish world doesn't seem to be very Jewish, does it? It's very Christian. And a lot of killings and persecutions and bad things, I hate to tell you, have happened to Jewish people for 2,000 years in the name of the cross. So when I preach to a Jewish person and say, you must believe this Jewish man that hung on a cross is your savior, that can be too very difficult for a Jewish person, but guess what? You have to do it. You have to come to the realization that that's what he came to do. It's not easy, but that whole scenario with the serpents was there for one reason, so Jesus could tell Nicodemus it's pointing to me. And then finally, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Does anybody remember the John 3.16 guy at the sporting events? He had kind of this big um, colored afro and he would sit behind the basketball hoop or the goal post. So Charlie, I told my wife that when I retire from chosen people, I'm going to reinvent the John 3.16 guy. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to say, Charlie, can we take an offering so I can have season tickets to the Boston Patriots and the Boston Celtics? Because I need good seats, Charlie. I need to be able to show the John 3.16 sign. And why did he pick John 3.16? Because it's a perfect text, right? For God so loved the world. See, the Jewish people think the Messiah was coming for the world. You know what the beauty is? Jesus says, I'm coming for everybody. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And that's taken from Psalm 2. A lot of Jewish people don't think, oh, God can't have a son. Well, he does. And Psalm 2 presents the fact that the Messiah is going to be the son of God. So it's interesting that Jesus is giving Nicodemus a whole Bible lesson on basically who the Messiah is. He didn't know. He knew very well after this. And you know what's amazing? Is all three of those came to be. When we saw Jesus being born through the virgin birth, that's how God decided to come into the world. He did die on a cross, and he did come from the whole world, and he said, you must be born Again, I don't think Connor's here because Connor left, right? You know, it's amazing what Connor did. He did something very Jewish today. He came to believe. My daughter came to faith at one of our Messianic camps, and they actually baptized her right there in the swimming pool, okay, which is pretty cool. But if you notice, now it's opposite. Now we have our faith, and that's the conversion and the baptism is a testimony to everyone to say, hey, I've changed. I am no longer Connor, who's a sinner. I'm Connor, who's been born again and have a new life, and I can enter the kingdom of God because I've been born both in the flesh and the spirit. And we got to witness a miracle today. I think every baptism is a miracle. Why? Why anybody would want to believe this sometimes is beyond me, but there's hope in the gospel and no other, no 
other message. So let me just bow our heads as um, if you want to know more about my ministry, I'll have my table, I have some books about what I've been teaching on this morning, and I would covet your prayers, and I have a sign-up sheet for our newsletter. And I want to thank First Baptist Church and Charlie for inviting me to come. I hope you enjoyed seeing Nicodemus and Jesus from a different perspective. Okay? Nicodemus, I don't know how many of you have seen Cho The Chosen, but he does have a compassionate heart. I think we know that this interaction with Jesus changed him. And I expect to see Nicodemus in heaven. Why? Because he was a rabbi? No. Because he was Jewish? No. Because he's born again. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for this text. It's such an incredible interaction where Jesus gets to lay out to the Jewish leaders. Here's the plan. And it was totally different. He is coming back in power. He's coming back on the clouds of heaven the next time to set up his kingdom for those of us who have been born again and have entered the kingdom. And Lord, thank you for saving me 35 years ago. Thank you for creating a system that has nothing to do with us. You entered the world, you died for us, and then you gave it to the world. We thank you, Lord, that we get to come in. And we don't get to do anything other than then give our life to you and believe that you took away our sins. Faith, because you were up on the pole just like the serpent, and having faith in this is what gets us in. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the people here, Lord. And Lord, I pray for Connor. I pray that you would use him mightily, that today would change his life. He committed his life to you at VBS, he got baptized to tell the church and the world that he is in, and now, Lord, use him. And I pray this in the name of Yeshua. Amen. You know, I think a lot of times we come to Jesus and uh, got s something different than we were expecting. I think sometimes we come to church and get something different than we're expecting. You know, Nicodemus, the chosen, the way they've portrayed him there, and I think I, I appreciate your perspective on that, Mitch. And one of the things that we know about the rest of the story of Nicodemus is when Jesus was crucified, Joseph of Arimathea, who was also a member of the Sanhedrin, asked for his body. And Nicodemus and Joseph of Arathea laid Jesus in that tomb. So I suspect that Nicodemus was born again. He had an encounter with Jesus, and he got something other than what he expected. And I wonder this morning, have you had an encounter with Jesus? I think it's hard to, hard to read John chapter 3. It's hard to read that passage of Scripture. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him, to not perish but have eternal life. It's hard to read that and not offer you an opportunity to respond to the gospel, the good news. You know, we, those that grew up in the church know verse 16 well. We, you memorize it as a child a lot of times, but don't, don't forget verses 17 and 18. See, Jesus didn't come to judge the world because the world's already been judged. We are all born sinful people. We are all born separated from God by that sin. And Jesus came to bridge that gap, to close that separation, to make reconciliation with God possible. And just like he told Nicodemus, Nicodemus, if you want to go to heaven, you have to be born again. Jesus said later, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. There's only one way to Jesus. It's by faith. You simply step out in faith. You don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to know all the answers to all the questions. You don't have to speak Hebrew or Greek. You don't have to have a great theological understanding. You simply step out in faith. 
book of Hebrews tells us that it's impossible to please God without faith. Because God's a spirit and the only way we can acknowledge Him, the only way we can comprehend and believe in Him is by faith. You know, we live in a world that's faithless. We don't have faith in government. We don't have faith in institutions. We don't have faith in anything except ourselves. And I can't speak for you, but I can speak for me. Myself always lets me down. God will never let you down. You know, I pray that Nicodemus' eyes were opened. I pray your eyes can be open. I want you to stand, and we're going to sing a song just for a few minutes. We have a couple other things that we want to do this morning before we're dismissed. But if you have not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, if you have not been born again, then there'll never be a better moment to do that than, than this morning. There'll never be a better moment in time to do that than this moment in time. And again, all you do is you do that by faith. You simply step out and say, God, I, I don't know all the answers. And my life's a mess. But I need you in my life. Because I look around the room and I look at other people that I know and I see that their life is better because of you. Would you take a step of faith today? It's as simple as that. Would you just take a step of faith? Say, Jesus, I, I believe you. I don't know why, because in my rational mind it makes no sense, but I'm willing to take a step of faith. God, I'm going to trust you. I'm just going to take a step of faith, Lord. And I'm going to cast all my cares upon you. Because it seems like somebody once told me that your burden is easy and your yoke is light. And right now I feel the weight of the world on my shoulders. If that's you this morning, would you just simply open your eyes and take a step of faith? Would you do that? We've already, we already had a wonderful service this morning. We've already had people that took a step of faith and walked out from their seat and came right down here. Nobody laughed at them. Nobody mocked them. Nobody said, look at that guy. Step of faith. All I'm asking you to do, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've never been born again, I'm just simply asking you to take a step of faith. And maybe you took that step of faith years ago, and right now you feel a million miles away from Jesus. You know the great thing about Jesus is He's everywhere all the time. And you may feel a million miles away from Him, but He's right there waiting for you. Would you take a step of faith this morning and just simply say, God, I'm so sorry that I've allowed myself to get so far away. Lord, I want to be close to you again. And you will be. Maybe, like Connor, you've been wanting to be baptized for a long time. Maybe you thought to yourself, I'm a grown man. I can't go up there and be baptized. Sure you can. We do it all the time. Would you take a step of faith this morning? Whatever God's asking of you, simply take a step of faith. And you'll find that once you take that first step, He'll meet you right where you are. So let's sing together. We'll worship for just a few minutes. Whatever the Holy Spirit's leading you to do, take that step of faith, would you?
shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing, holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Anybody else need to take a step of faith? Mario stepped out. Christ met him right where he was. He didn't walk down here alone. Anybody else need to take a step of faith this morning? Mario, come on up here, buddy. Mario. Hello. Come here, buddy. This is Mario Davila. Tomorrow has accepted Christ as his Lord and Savior, and he wants to he wants to follow. Yeah. He wants to uh, follow Jesus' example in believers' baptism. So we're going to talk about that. And we're going to set that up. He understands baptism doesn't baptism doesn't save him. That professing faith in Jesus Christ and Christ alone does that. But he wants the world to know I belong to Jesus. Jesus met me where I'm at. Amen? Amen, buddy. That's great. So I'm going to ask you to sit right back down there for just a second, if you would. I'm going to ask Kim and Marion if you guys would come forward. Marion, Kendi, where are you at, girl? There she is. Kim and Marion are headed to uh, Israel. They leave tomorrow morning for Houston and then fly out on Wednesday. Y'all stand right there, if you would, please. And uh, not, a, not a church ordained or sanctioned trip, but they're going. And, you know, anywhere... Anytime folks from our church go somewhere on a mission trip, they are ambassadors of this church. They are representatives of this church. So they go with our blessing. And they go under our covering. So I'm going to ask you guys, if you would, just come. You know, you've been here before. You know how we do this. You guys just come down. Ladies, I'm going to ask you all to step forward just a little bit so folks can come behind you. Thank you so much. Let's just surround them. We're going to pray over them. And Mitch, I'm going to ask you to come and stand right beside them if you would too because we're going to pray over you at the same time. We're going to pray over Kim and Marion and we're going to pray over Mitch. And if you're visiting with us, you're just going to have to get used to this because we, we believe in the power of prayer. We pray over folks. And we don't apologize for it. Father, we just come to you once again in the precious name of Jesus, Lord. Father, what a blessing it's been to hear from Mitch these past few days, Lord. What a blessing it's been, God, to hear a Jewish perspective. What a blessing it's been, God, to have a man, part of your chosen people, that had his eyes opened. And he understood what it was to be born again. And was born again. And then he took a step further. When you 
When you asked Isaiah, who will go for me? And Isaiah said, here am I, I'll go. I believe you had the same conversation with Mitch. Who will go for me? Who will speak to my people? Who better to speak to my people than one of my people that's been born again? So Mitch said yes. And he spends his life proclaiming the gospel to the chosen people, Israel. Father, wherever he goes, Lord, we pray that you order his steps. All the things he puts his hand to, Father, we pray that you make it to prosper. For his good, but for your kingdom's glory. We pray for his ministry, for chosen people ministry. We pray for God's chosen people to be ushered into the light in the midst of the darkness. That we pray for Marion and Kim as they, as they go to Israel on a mission trip and they'll be gone for, for the next couple of weeks. God, we pray that you order their steps. Father, we pray for divine protection, for safe travel as they go and as they minister in Israel and for safe travel home. We pray for all of the team that's going with Shor Shalom Ministries there, Lord. Father, we pray for every encounter and that people, as they meet Kim, as they meet Mary, and as they meet the rest of the team, that they experience the living Christ that lives in them, Lord. Father, whatever that team has need of, whether it's financial or, or material, or, or no matter what they have need of, God, I know that you already know the need, and I know that you're already meeting them at that point of need, whatever that may be. God, we just thank you in advance. And Father, we're excited for them to go, and Lord, we're excited for them to return because we want to hear the good report. We want to hear what you did through them and this team in Israel, God. God, I just can't thank you enough for those that say yes when you call. For those that are willing to walk in obedience, God, when you say go, they say yes. Lord, we thank you for the precious gift of your son, Jesus Christ. And that he too was willing to go when you said go. Even to the death on the cross. Lord, we love you. We thank you for Mario. We thank you for Connor, for their willingness to take a step of faith and public, publicly profess their faith in Jesus Christ. God, we give you all the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just a reminder, tuck your love offering to Chosen People Ministries. If you're going to write a check, just make it out, Chosen People Ministries. If it's cash, just put it in an envelope and write Mitch or Chosen People in there so it gets to the right place. God bless you guys. You're dismissed.